Hi, I'm Jules van Binsberg and a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm Jonathan Burke, a finance professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Today, a little bit of a change of plans. We have the bankruptcy episode ready to go. And at the last minute, the Senate passed a 1% tax on buybacks. And Jules and I had a buyback episode in the works. And we just decided that given the relevance, we should just delay the bankruptcy episode one more month. So let's talk about buybacks, Jules. Indeed. So first, what are buybacks exactly? Buybacks or share repurchases is the idea that companies can go into the open market and use some of the cash that they have to buy back the shares outstanding in the company. So you go to the equity market and you say, we are buying back the shares of our own company. Recently, this has gotten quite a bit of bad press, particularly by certain politicians, And so we want to use this episode to clarify exactly what stock repurchases are, how we should think about them, and then try to put into context whether or not these share repurchases deserve the bad reputation that apparently they are receiving. And so let's understand what the all else equal mistake is in these arguments. The first one, which, you know, Jules and I watched an interview with, uh, Elizabeth Warren and Elizabeth Warren's view is that when the sperm buys back shares, They were intentionally manipulating the stock and the buyback will drive the stock price up. And the firm is essentially manipulating its own stock price. Another argument that we're hearing is that the money that the firm spends on share repurchases is money that otherwise would have been spent on paying employees better, giving consumers products for lower prices, money that otherwise could have been invested in investment of the firm or innovation. And so essentially it's argued that this money is wasted on investors and not spent on good purposes, such as employees and investments. And another argument which we often hear is that when firms issue debt, in other words, borrow money to do a buyback, they're acting irresponsibly, essentially living on credit. So let's first understand what share repurchases are. And to do that properly, we first have to talk about the other thing, the opposite of it, and that is firms issuing shares. So the question is, why do firms decide to issue shares? Firms issue shares to raise capital. The great thing about our economic system is private individuals who have good ideas can go to capital markets. And there are people who will finance the ideas. And in other words, investors give money to the firm to make capital investments in return for having a share of the profits. And so now the question is, from the perspective of the investors, why would they want to pay for those shares? And the answer is, well, if at some point in time you want to give capital to the firm because you think that they will make productive investments with it, at some point you want to get something in return for that. So you want that capital be, to be returned at some point in the future. And as it turns out that there are two ways in which the firm can return that capital, and one of them happens to be share repurchases, which means that the firm goes back to the investors and says, we've now used the capital, we've made profits with it, and we're going to use the profits to return to you the initially invested money by repurchasing the shares from you. So the investors should sell the shares back to the firm and receive the cash in return. The second way for firms to return capital to the investors is to recall dividend payments, which implies that everybody who owns a share in the company can receive a certain dollar amount per share that we call the dividend per share that everybody receives as a compensation for being an investor in the firm. You know, Jules, it's worth taking a step back here because it's kind of funny. You would say to yourself, why is it okay for the firm to issue shares? Why is it okay for the firm to sell shares to investors, but not okay for the firm to buy those shares back. It would seem like those are two opposite sides of the same coin. I don't understand why one would be a good thing and the other one would be a bad thing. So let's understand, try to understand that in in greater depth. So let's start with the following question, which is when this firm issues shares, what happens to the stock price? The oil sequel argument is if the firm issues shares, the supply of shares has gone up, And we know what happens when the supply of something goes up, holding all else equal, 
the price goes down. But you cannot hold all else equal because the demand, of course, is commensurately going to go up as well. So that in the end, the price stays exactly the same. And I think that the way to explain this is through what I do in class a lot is with the Wharton Investment Club example. So let's run through that example real quick because I think it will make it clear what the forces are at play here. So suppose that there are 100 students in the class and we're going to start an investment club. The 100 students can each become a member of the investment club by paying $10 to become a member. This membership fee entitles them to get a membership certificate of the club. That is exactly what a share is. A share in a company is a certificate that states that you are co-owner of that club. So in this case, the ownership certificate is exactly the share. So 100 club members are all owning a $10 share, which means that the club in total has $1,000 to invest, 100 times $10. Now, of course, these ownership shares, you can just trade them around, meaning you can sell your share in the club. You own one hundredth of the club. So I can go to Jonathan and say to Jonathan, hey, do you want to buy from me one share in this investment club? And then Jonathan can pay $10 to me and I give him my ownership certificate. And then he owns two shares in the investment club and I own none. Now, the question is, what happens if the investment club wants to give money back to the members? All they did was take $10 from every member, they have $1,000, they did nothing with it, and now they wish to return it. Correct. They just had put it on a bank account, and so the club had $1,000 stashed on a bank account. So now, suppose that you wanted to return money to the club members. Now, there are two ways to do that. One way is to give every member a dividend. So suppose that every member gets a $2 dividend. If we have to pay 100 members a $2 dividend, that implies that the bank account balance goes from $1,000 to $800, which then also means that because we have 100 members that now collectively own an $800 bank account, that the membership certificate is now only worth $8. So every member got $2 in dividends and still owns a membership certificate equal to $8. Now, what is the other way of returning money to the investment club members? The other way is to do a stock repurchase, meaning we can simply go to say 20 members. And if we go to 20 members and we buy, the investment club buys from the 20 members the membership certificates back, then in the end, we've also returned $200 to the members. And very importantly, what happens to the price of the membership certificate? Membership certificate that's still trading are still trading at $10, right? They're now 80 members. And with $800, so each membership certificate is worth $10. So yes, by buying back shares, the supply of shares is reduced, but so is the total claim. And so when a firm buys back shares, there's no reason at all for the stock price to change. It's a classic all else equal mistake, right? All else are equal, the supply of something goes down, then the price should go up. At the same time, that the supply is going down, the claims are going down in exactly the same proportion, so that price stays the same. Exactly. And in fact, the irony, of course, is that the situation in which the stock price does change is actually the situation where the dividend is paid. Because when you pay the dividend, then the stock price does go down by the amount of the dividend. So, Jules, pretend that I wanted a dividend and the company decided to do a buyback. Am I out of luck? Well, the thing is that if you want to get cash out of your investment, you can always decide to sell some of your shares and get exactly the dollar amount that you want to have back by selling a number of shares that is commensurate with that. So you are not dependent on the firm to pay you the dividend. If you want to get out and you want to get cash that you want to consume or do something else with, then sell part of your stocks and you get the money that you want. Let's just be realistic. For the investment club, if they did a buyback, the share price would stay at $10. What would I do? I would sell one fifth of my shares and that would generate $2. And then the rest of my shares would be worth $8. It'd be exactly like a dividend got paid. Exactly. So what I think is important here is because we're now essentially showing that dividends and stock repurchases are pretty much the same thing. You cannot be in favor of one and against the other or vice versa. You have to come up with a friction 
Something about the world we have not assumed that somehow makes dividends different from buybacks. Indeed. You know, let's think about that because there are, in the real world, there are frictions. And one obvious answer is that if we don't have full information, it might be the case that dividends are different from buybacks. So let's go back to the Wharton example, right? Yeah. So let's assume that it, what happened was everybody gave $10, they got $1,000, the students were in the MBA program for two years, they invested the money, and now they're about to graduate, and there's a pot of money sitting there that they're not going to distribute. But only the person investing the money knows how much money is in that pot. Yes. Okay. And now they're deciding between a buyback or a dividend. And I'm asked the following question. The person who's investing the money suggests that we do a buyback at the original price, at $10. He wants to buy back the shares at $10. What would your reaction to that be, Jules, if you were one of the other investors? Well, so what you have now introduced, Jonathan, is what we call an information asymmetry, right? We have the situation where the, in, the guy who runs the investment management club who runs the investments, he knows more than everybody else. And so by his announcement that he wants to do the buyback, he is revealing information about how well the investments in the club have done. But the reason why he wants to do it at the original price is that he knows that the club is really worth more than that. The money has done better. He's invested at a high return. So there is more money in the pot than what the original price suggests. And so if the other club members are updating from this information revelation, the fact that he wants to do it this way, they will realize that he has just revealed that the investment has done better. And they will say, you know what? Um, I'm not actually going to sell my shares back to you because I know that you would only do this if the shares are worth more than $10. So if you want to do a buyback, we're not doing it for $10. No, and so there is a higher price at which you then will have to agree to do the buyback at. So the idea that sometimes when a firm announces a stock buyback, we see the price go up is perfectly consistent with the idea that the management of the firm knows more about what's going on inside the firm. And the reason why they want to buy the shares back is that they think the shares in the market are currently undervalued. The firm is worth more. And therefore, they want to buy them back, which means that the other investors will increase the price at which the shares traded because they realize that the firm is actually doing better than they thought. If the investment club had lost money, and so there was less than $1,000 in that investment club, and the head investor said, look, I'm going to buy everybody else's shares back, we know he would never choose a buyback because he would be losing money. For sure. So... The same holds true for a firm. If they are choosing to do a buyback, they must think the price is lower than what they think the true value is. So now let's think about another friction that makes buybacks somewhat different than dividends, right? We've already talked about the information channel just now. If there's asymmetric information, it's one reason. But another reason why buybacks and dividends are somewhat different is the taxation of them. Right now, it is actually the case that dividends and capital gains are taxed at the same rate. But buybacks have a big advantage from an investor's perspective because they get to choose. You only pay the taxes if you choose to participate in the buyback. Right? That's not the case with the dividend. The dividend, you get it in either case. Although it's also true that many investors invest in retirement accounts where they won't have to pay the taxes right now, right? That's true. But the fact that on a buyback, you can choose not to pay the taxes now, of course, eventually you'd have to pay the taxes because eventually you'll sell. But because you could choose to delay the capital gain, that in effect means the buyback is more attractive than a dividend from a tax perspective. So now let's go back to all the arguments that we used in the beginning. What is all the big fuss about? So the first question we need to answer is, why do you think people believe that share buybacks are a bad thing? There are people out there, including the politicians that are now taxing the buybacks, that believe that dividends are somehow better and different than the stock buybacks. I don't know if we asked that question, Jules. The reason we decided we wanted to do this episode was just, we were puzzled. I mean, a buyback and a dividend are essentially the same thing. So let's go through the fallacious arguments. One of the fallacious arguments is, well, 
the firm is spending money buying back stock that it could spend money on employees. But that's a fallacious argument from the point of view that eventually the firm has to return capital to the investors. If the firm doesn't return capital to investors, the investors won't invest in the firm. They won't be a firm to begin with. So there is a certain amount of capital that investors expect to receive. So this is just a choice of how you return capital to investors. It has nothing to do with how much you pay your employees. In some sense, what you pay your employees is determined by the labor market and who you can hire, not by investors at all. And even management don't choose what they pay employees. People have to pay employees what labor markets dictate. And then the second question is that people say, well, the money spent on the stock approaches shouldn't been spent on investment or innovation. But what I think that ignores is, is that companies need to decide whether they have projects, investments, innovation projects that they want to spend the money on. What if you don't have any productive investment opportunities inside your firm? Are they just supposed to hold on to the cash or are they allowed to say, Let's repurchase the shares, return the capital to investors so that the investors can decide where they want to productively put this capital. What is the benefit of saying to firms, you need to hold this inside the firm, you're not allowed to do a stock buyback, or we're going to tax stock buybacks to discourage you from doing them? Academics worry tremendously about managers not returning capital. And the reason is, when a manager chooses to return capital, they are essentially saying to the investors, our growth opportunities are not as good as they used to be. And it's time for you to find better growth opportunities with other investments. And that's a hard statement for a manager to make. It's much easier for the manager to hold on to the cash and put the money into bad investments. Yes. Or executive jets or condos in Florida. Yes. The fact that a manager chooses to return capital is actually a very strong signal about the quality of the manager that is prepared to return capital and admit to investors that the profit opportunities of the firm are not what they used to be. You know, Microsoft didn't pay a dividend for years and years and years. And eventually the company said, okay, we're no longer as innovative as we used to be. And it's time to return capital to investors. Indeed, I think that by preventing firms from returning the capital, you're just encouraging them to waste it on perks and on unproductive things. The whole point of our economy and the reason we're so successful is our capital markets allow capital to be reassigned from unproductive firms to productive firms. At the same time, Microsoft started paying a dividend. Google came around and effectively money left Microsoft and went to Google. And that was a more productive investment. And that's why the economy does so well. For sure. So now let's talk about policy then. So the policy proposal in particular is. Let's tax buybacks at a 1% rate. What is the general equilibrium response of doing this? Well, it seems pretty obvious that buybacks become less attractive. So that means that that way of returning capital is going to become less interesting. And so less of it will happen. Some of it will probably be substituted for with higher dividend payments, meaning that if buybacks become less attractive, the firms may return some more capital through dividends. But it may also lead in equilibrium, given the other frictions that are happening, to just lower returning capital to investors, period. And then the question is, what is happening to that money that is not being returned? One of the risks is that it's going to be wasted on unproductive things. Well, I mean, it's hard to know exactly what's going to happen because, you know, the world's complicated. But imagine the dividend route was impossible, which is an incorrect assumption. But imagine you couldn't pay dividends and you put a 1% tax on buybacks. That's essentially saying, but prepared to invest in an investment with a lower return than otherwise. So that lowers the return on, on alternative investments. And so the firm does worse investments. Of course, that argument is mitigated by the fact the firm can just pay a dividend. So it's hard to know exactly what would happen. No, it, it is hard, but we will also see some effect where dividends become more attractive. I think that's, that's a substitution that seems reasonable to happen. But as long as there's some limits to how much those dividends can be increased, I think the effects you just described is what's going to happen. And the last fallacious argument we should talk about just before we finish the episode up is that when firms issue debt to finance buybacks, that that's somehow irresponsible behavior. And that's a more complicated question. And we will, in fact, discuss that when we eventually do the bankruptcy episode. Eventually, indeed, <laughs> which I look forward to. Thank you for listening, everybody. 
We'll be back to our regular schedule a month from now. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcasts. We love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcasts. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by Alumni FM.